everybody. Welcome back to our channel, Red Bull Coffee and Crime. Today we have a special guest um, with us today, uh, Harry Oaks. Hey, Harry. Hi. How are you? Hanging in there. Good. We have Arctic Fox True Crime. Hey, hey. And we have my coffee today. We have Garnett. Hello, guys. Good morning. Um, we are going to be going over, uh, you know, the case of um uh the disappearance of ashley pond and miranda uh goddess G yeah, G yeah. um you know which is ward weaver case harry uh helped find the girls in this case so i asked him if he would come on because he knows a lot about it um so we're just gonna discuss you know some things about the case um so you know, I don't know, for those of you that don't know the case, um, I can go over it real quick. Or, Harry, do you want to? Well, basically, I can just run through it real quick. Okay. Um, for many, many years, from 1986 up till the 2002, uh, I was the go-to guy for the National Missing Children's Locate Center in Portland, Oregon. They would contact me anytime a child disappeared, and then I would use my prior 12 years of law enforcement skills as well as my uh, 20 some odd year at that time, 20 some odd years of search and rescue experience uh, and my canines to, to track down the child. And so when Ashley Pond disappeared, I contacted her mom, Lori Pond, that was on March 4th, is when I was asked to enter the search uh, by Ashley's mom, Lori, and the National Missing Children's Locate Center. <clears throat> it's common practice for me to contact the local law enforcement to make sure that we don't interfere with their case. Uh -huh. So I contacted Oregon City PD and said, do you mind if I come in on this? And they said, uh, we have our own teams. We don't need any assistance. I'm like, okay, fine. So I backed off because it's their case. Yeah. And uh, they refused any assistance from anybody else but their own people. Mm -hmm. And so they uh, looked for her, and they talked to Ward, and they talked to a variety of her fellow school students. Ward had a daughter that's the same age as these young ladies. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, the bottom line is, if for a month, they, uh, they continued to search and couldn't find anything. And then um, the, the month of the day, uh, March 8th, uh, Miranda Gaddis disappeared. And same age, um, all last seen at Ward's property, talking to Ward's daughter. So they, um, oh, I have a question. Right uh, yeah. So um, Ashley disappeared first, right? Yes. That's what you said. And she was, it was at a bus stop or? Uh, my understanding is she went, to Ward's house and then wasn't seen since. Okay, okay. And Ward had claimed that she was headed to the bus stop, but we all believe that's a lie. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so anyway, when Miranda disappeared, again, I contacted Oregon City PD. And at this time they had finally just started getting the FBI involved in the, looking for Ashley. And <clears throat> we have a running joke in search and rescue. If you want somebody found you call us but if you want some a case screwed up royally call the fbi <laughs> they do not have a clue what they're doing when it comes to finding missing children you know, i'll stand here with 51 years of experience and say that to their face and oh this, wow so you this, think this is a case it's just a classic example of with how they screwed it up mm -hmm. so anyway um Again, they said, no, we don't need any help. It's like, okay, fine. So I backed off. In the meantime, the mothers of Lori Pond and Ashley and Miranda Gaddis are contacting the National Missing Children's Center because that's what they do. And said, we, you know, we need help because nobody's finding our, our daughters. And the FBI and Oregon City PD went public and <coughs> searched uh, Ford's property seven different times mm -hmm. and went public and said, the, the girls are not here on the property. We've searched it seven times. Uh, and then they posted a big bulletin board 
in Oregon City saying, do you know where these girls are with a picture and a $10,000 reward uh, for information of anybody who come forward with the location of the girls? Um, on March 4th, I had sent Lori that my initial letter saying, you know, we'd like to help. She called me on March 6th saying, yes, I, you know, I want you in on this. Question. I, uh, this was brought up before um, somebody asked um, when parents, so is it law enforcement when they tell you to back off? If parents ask you to come in, you're allowed to, right? I can work privately on behalf of the parents. I just can't trespass on any private property without the landowner's consent. Okay. And they can't interfere with the investigation. Mm-hmm. And having been, you know, worked law enforcement for 12 years, I know what's interfering, what's not interfering. So I, you know, did, I stayed off of Ward's property, did not interfere with their search efforts. Um, on March 7th, I met with Lori uh, and obtained scent articles and photographs uh, belonging to Ashley and also uh, started, you know, the initial administrative part of the case. Um, on March 10th, I was able to get a, a, a good pillowcase and a backpack as a scent article to, to go find Ashley. And we started our initial search. We tracked for, uh, from where Ashley lived to uh, Ward's property directly. It didn't go anyplace else. It just went from the apartment complex there at Beaver Creek Apartments uh, right up to Ward's house. And didn't go any further than that. Didn't go to a bus stop. Didn't go to anybody else's house. So that led me to believe that, that you know, he was our suspect. On March 15th at 1127, I arrived at the Ward's house and was met by his son, Alex, and explained to him that I was a private search and rescue person with the National Missing Children's Locate Center and asked if he'd mind if uh, we could search the property. He said, well, let me talk to my dad. So Ward got on the phone and said, sure, everybody else has been on there, so go ahead, I don't care. And uh, my dog, and me, search dog at the time, Valerie, alerted in the hallway, and there was a lay down freezer in the kitchen that was big enough to hold a couple bodies. Oh, wow. And uh, my dog immediately went from where the she gave the death alert in the hallway to uh, the freezer. I tried opening the freezer, and Alex turned about five shades of white. Um, and he, I said, do you have a key to this? He goes, oh, no, I don't. My dad does. It's like, okay. So I just played stupid, and I, I knew that there had at least at one time been a body in there. Otherwise, the dog would not have alerted on it. So I then continued to search the property. When I went out his back door, there was a large concrete slab that was on, had been laid there a couple months before, I believe, like back in February. And this was, you know, late March. Um, so my dog alerted where the grass and the concrete met, where they both, both came together. My dog gave a death alert there. And then I continued on to search. And there's a small shed behind the house. And I opened it up because the dog alerted in there. And there was five no pest strips laying, hanging from the inside a small shed loaded with dead flies. Oh. And the place was full of cardboard boxes and plastic bags. So I figured there was a body in there at that time. Other, you know, what else would it draw the flies into there? And why would you have no pest strips in a small shed? Yeah. Okay. So I went ahead and backed off. I took pictures and, and documented everything and wrote up a report. And that was on March 15th. And I submitted it to Oregon City PD and to the FBI and a copy to the parents. Uh, we continue to search apartments in the area on March 17th, and uh, I also had another dog handler with me named Michelle Keating with her dog, Yogi, who's a golden retriever, and he did exactly what my dog had did, and I never told uh, Michelle where my dog had alerted. I wanted to see, you know, do an honest search and see if her dog would do the same thing, which he did, and so... At that time, we were told by the FBI to back off Ward's property because they were watching him. Um, mm. well, that's their case, so I have no other choice but to, I submitted my report. Now, I did find some, back up above, around Beaver Creek uh, apartments in the woods there, I did find some 
coyote feces with some human remains in it. And I also found some bones that I believe to be human. Now, I'm a former EMT of 20 some odd years, so I know what a human bone looks like. Mm -hmm. I recovered lots of them in search and rescue. Now, I took this uh, bone over to Sunnyside Hospital to orthopedics and said, is this human or animal? And I knew it was human, but I wanted a doctor to say this was human. And mm -hmm. that's exactly what he did. He wrote a note and said, this is a human femur. And mm -hmm. I took it over to Oregon City PD, who kept saying, oh, there's a lot of dead deer out here. Well, it's, it's a dead animal. I said, no, it's not. They were arguing with me. So anyway, I took the bones over there, put it on the, the Oregon City PD's chief police desk and said, with a note from the, the hospital saying, this is a human bone. And then the chief said, oh, where'd you get this at? And I told him. And we believe that was the third victim. And I honestly believe that another oh, member of the family was involved in that one. Oh, my. And that was, I believe that was a runaway from Portland, a 16-year-old runaway from Portland. That, that the remains that we were uh, finding there. Anyway, uh, we submitted our report and come August, they hadn't done anything and I was livid. Uh, there was no excuse. They could have gotten the search warrant based on our findings because mm -hmm. uh, I had found four other bodies before this for the FBI. So I had credibility Yeah. Uh, on other searches in other states. And I saw there was no excuse for them not to follow up on this but they they're playing their little political games and said well we didn't find anything and it's like i don't care if you did or not we did but anyway bottom line is i finally got a hold of senator i won't say what his name is but i called a certain senator on uh, in august mm -hmm. and said you know what this has been a, a very big disappointment on how they handled this case we know where the bodies are they're not going anywhere and i don't want war destroying any more evidence which you forced the FBI to go in there and dig up the slab underneath the concrete and open up that shed behind his house and recover the bodies. And he said, I'll handle it. And the next day they were in there with their ground penetrating radar going, oh, look what we found. Now, at no time did they give us credit for finding anything. The parents did and the media did. Um, but the FBI was so embarrassed about how they handled this case in, in Oregon City PD was so embarrassed on how they handled this case. They screwed it up to 100%. And it's my opinion, professional opinion, um, that had they called us in on January, we could have saved Miranda's life. We could have, you know, had Ward in custody, had Ashley located, and probably the second or the third young lady, um, the remains that we found up there in Beaver Creek Apartments uh, in the woods there, I believe that we could have saved her life too. So those, um, the, the, the bones, they ended up finding out who they belong to. And uh, they would never, they would never tell me, but yeah, they, we believe that it was a, like I said, a runaway from Portland. Oh my gosh. So they. Yeah. And Ward, when he was interviewed, um, when they finally did arrest him, he said, Hey, Harry Oaks is right. A hundred percent. Him and his dogs nailed it. He said, you guys are. He, he actually laughed at the FBI's face and said, you guys are a joke. Oh, my gosh. Of course, they won't tell you that, but that's what I heard from the arresting officers and stuff. So when you were searching, like, how was, so you've met Weaver, of course. Yeah. And how was his demeanor? Like, what was he? He was cocky. Uh, I've met many people over the years. I, I've been involved in over 40 homicide cases. And uh, help solving them and stuff with the search dogs. And he was cocky. You know, he, he thought he'd gotten away with it because here he, they'd searched this place, didn't find anything, and they were walking right on top of the bodies the whole time. And he just was smiling up with, you know, like, and I got nothing to hide. Oh, my gosh. So what, what makes your dogs? Like, why, how did the FBI and the police bring their dogs in? And then what, what makes your dogs? like better oh. than oh, theirs no. because you it's, it's a it's a handler and dog issue i trust my dogs uh-huh and you know they obviously didn't trust theirs uh they should uh, i don't know they would never submit any of the reports given to them by uh search one canine detection the team that they use for the state of oregon and uh 
I don't, so I don't know. I can only speak for, uh, uh, we have a long history of success. Everything's documented. It's all been admitted to, in court and accepted in the courtroom. Yeah, and, because you guys have only been wrong, what, I think it, I think it was five, five times out of all these cases or? I, I've been wrong five times, uh, three on missing pet cases and two on missing person cases. Not that the person, I had one case where a lady set us up. She uh, went to the end of the boat ramp uh, or a boat dock at a houseboat area, made a lot of contacts with people contacting her and talking to her and she disappeared. And the, the Portland police called me to track her. We tracked her to the end of the dock. Uh, we put a diver in because the dogs were alerting in there and they brought up her shoe that showed the family her shoe and said, they said, yeah, that's her shoe. So with the dog saying, you know, she's in the water, and the diver bringing out her shoe, we assumed she was in the water. Turned out she set us up. She had a new boyfriend and she was in Vegas with a new boyfriend the next week. Oh, wow. So, but you know, the dogs were right on the scent. Her scent was in the water, but she, she just, she was smart enough to know how to, to work the system. But that was one I was wrong on. And then another one where my dogs alerted in one spot, turned out the body was a couple hundred yards away in a, in a different area. And the water was, scent was being carried by the wind and the water to that area. Uh, Widow, this is Harry Oaks. Um, he is, um, well, he's a search and rescue. He's solved, we're talking about the case, uh, Ward Weaver case. Um, who Ashley Pond and Miranda uh, Gaddis? Am I saying that? I can't say that name. Um, went went missing, and Harry um, actually found their bodies. And he's done a lot. He's had you said how many cases? Forty. Uh, I've done over fourteen thousand eight hundred kit calls uh, yeah. around the world. We we're international. We do earthquakes, bombings, kidnappings, drownings, tsunamis, tornadoes floods, fires, uh, murder, homicide cases, suicide cases. Yeah, it's, he also has a book, you guys. And Harry, I'm looking in my email because I know I had your book because you emailed it to me and I cannot find it. I have two, two books out. One's called The Call of Duty. It's about search and rescue through the search dog's eyes. That's my first book. It's my search dog, Ranger, who was my second dog that I rescued from the dog pound and trained. And we used him in the Northridge earthquake. We used him in the Philippine earthquake and a, a variety of different homicides all over the United States. And uh, the second book is uh, uh, over a thousand pages. It's called Search and Rescue. And it teaches people from ground zero that doesn't don't, don't know anything about search and rescue, which includes district attorneys, judges, law enforcement. And it talks about how to train the handler for search and rescue, how to train the dog in all aspects. So a lot of dog search dog teams focus just on one type of searching, like either air sending wilderness or cadaver or water. We do it all. We, we, we train and test in jungles and deserts, uh, wilderness, urban, rural, and uh, water, land. And we've had, lots and lots of documented success in each of those areas and that's why we're you know for 51 years i've been successful yeah it's amazing what you guys what you have done um you. you know if you guys want to check this book out um it's free of, it's free of charge you just write me on our website here uh oh this is your email, the Sardog uh, K91, right? So, yeah, it's S A R D O G K91 at gmail.com. I will put that in the uh, link and the description when we get off of here, you guys. So if you're want, because I have it, I just I need to find it. And I started reading it. It's a lot, but it's very interesting. Um, Harry has a lot of stories to talk about and his life. Um, he's done a lot of good um not only with people but animals like you said we do both people and pets as well as evidence um the first book is guided for families and children and people because it's not it's got a coloring book in there for the kids teaches them how to stay safe uh, talks about what they should carry and how to use it in case they get lost 
But it also it talks about my Help Us Find You educational program, which has saved 16 lives so far to date. Uh, it also talks about how a search dog is trained through the search dog's eyes. Mm -hmm. And then the second book, Search and Rescue, is for adults. It's not for kids because it has pictures of deceased victims that we found. And it's not, some of these pictures are not good, uh, suitable for children. Okay, well, that's good to know. So, yeah, you guys, there's an email if you would like a book sent to you. Um, Harry's really good at doing that. I got mine like the same day. I just, I don't know why I cannot find it. That's okay. Yeah, I was gonna read, <laughs> I was gonna read some, and I'm like, did I by accident erase it when I was pulling it up last night? Well, so if you I, send me an email, I'll be glad to send you another book. Yeah, I am definitely emailing you when we get off of here, Harry. I'm I'm very interested. Okay. Um, I I just wanted to ask you, do you think that I it's so shocking to me for you to be for them to be in there seven times with dogs, and they didn't find these two girls, but you walk in and almost immediately. Mm -hmm. you, you're, you've hit, do you think that it was intentionally that they weren't finding things or? No, they're just, uh, I've come in so many times. I found nine people in the search area that they, yeah, on other searches that year, uh, where the state of Oregon search dogs said they weren't there. And we went in and said, they're right here. It's just a uh, matter of experience. So, so like, <laughs> I can't. <laughs> Yeah, I think I'm trying to make excuses because we go to sleep at night thinking, you know, if the unimaginable happens, the police are who we call and that's who we trust to have. Like, I don't know. It just. I, I support our law enforcement 100 percent. I think right. men and women do a fantastic job for what they have to work with. But. When politics and egos gets between the victim and their families, mm -hmm. that's where I draw the line. And I actually ended up testifying against the state of Oregon State Sheriff's Association, who uh, who monitors and uh, works search and rescue after they killed two children for the lack of using search dogs. Uh, Nathan Matson, missing on a pony in Shmuel, Oregon, and Derek Gigabritson at uh, down in Klamath Falls when he disappeared. Uh, they refused to use search dogs. We came in and found out what happened to each of the children. And it's my professional opinion that we could have saved both their lives that we'd been called in in the first night. And right. there's just no excuse for that. See, I guess so, I come into all of this from a, a different perspective because I see cases every day where these girls and boys go missing and they're automatically labeled runaways. And law enforcement doesn't even make any effort to try to find them, much less bring dogs into search for them or anything of that nature. So, I mean, I guess give credit where it's due. They did at least go try to find these two girls. But, you know, I, I just get so frustrated because I cover case after case every day where they're just stamped to run away. Anyone above the age of 12 that goes missing, they're stamped to run away. Yeah, it's very frustrating. Um especially when you sit there and watch these FBI agents who get paid $25, $35 an hour, standing in the middle of Beaver Creek Road, <laughs> handing out flyers. What the hell? They should be out there talking to witnesses and interviewing uh, witnesses and suspects and not handing out flyers. Explorer Scouts can do that. Yeah. No, th th that, ha that case was so mishandled. Okay, Harry, somebody says, uh, Widow asked, how long after someone goes missing do the dogs come out? I know right away is best, but sometimes the, that's not the case. The longest I've been successful in finding human remains was eight, 18 months after the person disappeared. Now that's, I found a slave grave in St. Croix. I was over there teaching search and rescue to law enforcement and the fire department. And my dog went over to a sugarcane field and alerted, and we dug up a body there. It turned out back in the slave days, when a slave died, there was no marker. They just buried him and went on right. with their work. And now she was buried in the late 1800s. So that wasn't how long that grave had been there. But oh for, for actually tracking a scent from point A to point B, the longest I've been successful is 18 months. Oh, wow. The sooner the better, obviously, because the more 
people that walk on top of that area contaminate it and can mess it up. Absolutely. Harry, I have I have just one more question for you. Sure. Um, as a parent, mm -hmm. if my child goes missing tomorrow, mm -hmm. um, uh, what is my first after I've reported them? Of course. But then what is my first, when, when is that line that says, um, I need to get somebody else involved? I okay. need to. Let's back up just a second. The first thing you should do is uh, be preventative, meaning how many of you parents have your child fingerprinted, photographed, and all that stuff stored at home? Oh, see, I need to uh, do that. You know. Oh, when, actually, we're getting you on that. Well, see, the thing is, is that when I'm knocking on your door and I say I need some light, you to show me who your child is because I've never met your child. In, in it. Uh, you're going to have to produce some fingerprints. You're going to have to produce a scent article. You're going to have to produce a photograph and a, a chart of if, if there's any medical known issues like these piercings, tattoos, stuff like that. So as a parent, I'm a grandparent. You know what we uh, ask parents to do is before anything happens, you you. Every year before the, the day after the child's birthday, I recommend that you set the child down. You take two pictures. The first picture is a face picture. Mm -hmm. And the second page uh, picture is the ear. We want you to pull the hair back and give us a picture of their ear. They, don't, they can't change and alter the ear picture. And we can match that up with security cameras at the bus stations, trains, airports, uh, the borders. Uh, also, tape record their voice. We, that we can have a voice print of them. Uh -huh. You can take a Q, put on a, a rubber glove and swab a Q-tip on the inside of their mouth so we have a DNA uh, of the child and put that in a clean paper envelope. You could comb out their hair and put their hair inside of a paper envelope and throw that in the freezer with the date on it. It's good for about 10 years as a sin article. Uh, and then, again, each year the day after, they, uh, after their birthday, do it again. Uh, new photographs, new pictures. Uh, new diagrams of you know, how tall they are, how much they weigh, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the child gets older, the things are more readable. Harry, uh, widow, I'm sorry to interrupt. Widow said, "Why the ear?" Because the ear can't be changed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a lot of the bad guys. It's very common for a bad guy to meet or a gal to meet a child or have another child meet a child at a mall buy them a soft drink or a, a milkshake and load it with uh, rohypnol, which is a date rape drug they can get over the internet. Mm -hmm. And it paralyzes the child. And they just tell anybody who asks what's wrong with the child, oh, they're mentally retarded or have men mental health issues. And nobody's going to challenge that. And then yeah. they, they take them to a van or a motel and they cut their hair, make a boy look like a girl or a girl look like a boy. The thing is, is that with those photos, we can match them up right away. And what's nice about having a search dog, you can't change your scent. I have found so many runaways who have, oh, don't look like anything that their parents have told me what they look like. I oh, wow. Another girl from Oregon City 10 years later that disappeared. And I went down to Pioneer Courthouse Square where I was told that she liked to hang out. And my dog kept alerting on this five foot four redhead with uh, piercings. And I'm looking for a five foot blonde uh, with no piercings, no tattoos. And it turned out my dog kept alerting on her. And I finally uh, said, are you so-and-so? And she started to run. I said, don't, because I have police right across the street waiting for you. Yeah, which, you know, they were across the street eating donuts at Nordstrom's, but she, oh didn't, she didn't know that. But anyway, um, she stopped and she had altered her, her look. She dyed her hair, got some piercings, had some fake tattoos. I never would have, without the dog, I never would have identified it. Wow. And I just remember the whole ear thing because somebody, you know, um, in Kyron's case, when they saw, the, uh, saw Kyron, they were mentioning the ears. Like there was a side picture yeah. from the ears, and that does make sense. I guess the ears never change. So, in answer I, to I, question, I, Will, <laughs> I'm sorry, in answer to your question, the sooner that we're out there, the better. Now, even if the police are watching their own investigation, you, it doesn't hurt for us to be out there looking as well. We're not going to step on their toes. We're not going to say, you know, scoot over, we're coming in. We don't do that kind of stuff. We let them do their search. And if they find things, great. If they don't, then 
You can't yeah. hurt the rest of going on. But why? Right. Okay, in 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 Lucian's um, case, like if you if you find well, this isn't really any case. If you find if your dog sent somewhere, and uh, they decide not to go look at that area, there's just nothing else you can do. The only thing I could have done was to bring out a boat and you know got out there and look myself but the problem is i ended up donating all my time and money on that case uh i never got paid for gas or food or motel or you know anything like that yeah and that's fine you know it's the child he needed, he needed to be found yeah um, the but funding seems to be a big deal i'm sorry what funding is a big deal finding those yeah. funds to get the people out there that we need Yes. Um, you know, there was a guy that did donate two different dives. He dove into Cannon Lake twice. And then, of course, sadly, you know, this young man was not there. He was in the river right next door. Yeah, you guys, this is uh, Harry actually volunteered to help find Lucian, um, you know, and his dog hit. How many feet did we? About 100 feet away from where? Where Lucian was found. Well, he was found downriver after that. Yeah. Uh, the river's moving at 12 feet per second, so it can take a body quite a few miles. Wow. See, I, I just think it's, it's so amazing what you do and how much time without even, you know, saying, hey, I need this, this amount, I need this amount. Um, you're definitely an amazing person. You... Thank you. I do it because I, I enjoy working with my dogs. I enjoy working in the outdoors. Yeah. I enjoy bringing closure. Every once in a while, we can make a difference. You know? Every once in a while, we can save one. What made you want to start doing this in the first place? Um, um, I was May of 1980. Well, I started in search and rescue through the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office when I was a cadet uh -huh. at age 16 in the Boy Scouts. And started getting involved in search and rescue there uh, for lost people in Large Mountain and in the gorge and stuff like that. Uh, when I got out of the military, I was in law enforcement and also in charge of as a search and rescue coordinator for Morrill County Sheriff's Office on cases up there. And then I also was, uh, did Mount Hood Ski Patrol uh, in the back Nordic Ski Patrol areas and was part of Portland Mountain Rescue in May of 1986 when the, we lost the kids up there in the Oregon Fiscal School accident. And it was actually the OAS accident that brought me into working with the dogs. Um, at that time, I had worked around dogs, but never worked with a canine personally. And so I went to Rocky Mountain Rescue Dog Association and got trained to be a dog handler. And that was uh, seven dogs ago uh, yeah, and uh, 37 years ago. So wow so seven dogs you had um yeah. is it hard to train them like how long is it usually take to get them fully trained um, it takes about two years to get a dog fully certified for all aspects of search and rescue i mean the the hardest part is training the handler how to, to trust and read the dog uh, -huh. uh i've had so many times i've had dog handlers say well there's nothing here and we're like you're standing right on top of it uh, hello <laughs> yeah. oh yeah we had a case where a, a portland fire department called me in uh, because they had a little child missing at oaks park and uh they had brought in the state certified search dogs again the same people that screwed up the ashley pond case uh but anyway they used them and said oh there's nothing here and me, myself, and one of my other dog handlers went right to the do boat dock and said, there's a body underneath the boat ramp, underneath Ooh. the dock. And they said, oh, we've already searched that. And I said, well, the dogs don't know how to lie. So the poor mom was beside herself. She was right there watching the whole thing. Oh. And I told her, I said, I'm not a diver. I blew an eardrum. I can't dive anymore. And uh, I said, we're going to have to just see if we can get another diver in tomorrow or Anyway, the bottom line is the next day, the the uh, a ship came by, kicked up the dock, a, a wave kicked up the dock, and the body popped out in front oh. of the kids. And so there, our dogs were 100% correct. It was just laziness on behalf of Portland Fire Bureau yeah. and the dive, dive team. 
I, I can never understand that. What What does it hurt just looking where, I mean, they see your record. They see what you've done and why can they just not take that time? It's politics and egos. They, yeah. They, a lot of times they're like, oh, we don't, we don't want anybody telling us how to do our job. It's like, well. It's ridiculous, but it's life we're talking about. It's families. It's yeah, I understand. But it, it is what it is. It is what it is. It's just crazy. We had, we had, a, we found a young man who committed suicide at Multnomah Falls. Uh, his family had reported him missing. They found his car at Multnomah Falls. They couldn't find him. It was during an ice storm. It was 20 degrees out with a half inch of ice all over the trails. Very dangerous. And Multnomah County went up and did their search, couldn't find anything, called the search off. The, the, his fiance hired me to go in and find him. We tracked him to where he jumped to his death in the upper pond there. I reported it to Multnomah County Sheriff's Office because that's their jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And they refused to go get him. It was six months later when the body was so badly decomposed and smelling that the park rangers complained and they finally had to go in and get him. Wow, that's what we're that facing. breaks my heart. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it really does. I mean, it's not every sheriff like that, but um, Polk County and Smithy County and Clark County used to support us 100% before I ended up testifying against the Sheriff's Association, and uh, that ended up going private after that. What makes uh, I know that, um, like we've talked about, um, I'm not going to go into it, but in like Kyron's case, you had to testify against that uh, one county. <laughs> like, county, yeah. what makes you uh, why do you have to go in there? And is it for the case or for the people that you found? Or, um, uh, I in uh, I went when when. Uh, the let's see nathan masson disappeared and we went in and we were able to pinpoint where his body was and then when derek ingerbrins had died it, it as a former law enforcement the way the laws are written in the state of oregon if you do something that causes somebody else to die or if you don't do something that causes somebody to die you can be charged with manslaughter and i, I believe just because you're wearing a badge you're not exempt and here we had a sheriff who refused to use search dogs because he didn't like them. They put over 2,000 searchers in on, for the Nathan Masson case, couldn't find him. We found him in the search area, dead, within two miles of the point last seen and not too rough of terrain. He did everything right. He, uh -huh. he let his pony go, he took the saddle, slept on top of the saddle, put the horse blanket on top of that, waited for help that never came. And the sheriff's excuse was, well, there's two inches of snow. Dogs can't track through snow, which is bull. I mean, we use we we find people buried in 20, 30 feet of avalanches and snow and ice. So that was just a bunch of bull. And I, I just need to hear that again. You said two inches of snow. Yeah, it snowed two inches, and the sheriff <laughs> used search dogs because he felt they couldn't track in snow. Oh my God. And then um when Derek Ingebrigtsen died, I mean disappeared, I, the family remembered me or our team going in and finding Nathan's remains. So they called, this family called me right away and the sheriff had already called off the search and we had found where he slept. I had the family with me when we tracked and we tracked up Pelican Butte, found where he spent the night underneath the log. He had a little hatchet. You could see where he was pounding away at the, underneath the log, where he climbed a tree to avoid a cougar where he went down the other side of the butte and fell through the ice and, and marsh and drowned. And had we been able to go in the first night, we would have caught up with him at, at where he was sleeping underneath the log and saved his, saved his life. But anyway, the bottom line is that sheriff cost those two boys their lives, in my opinion, for not using search and rescue properly. Oh. And when I, I went to my lieutenant at the sheriff's office and said, what can we do? And he said, there's nothing we can do unless you change the laws. So I went to the Oregon legislature and met with Mary Alice Ford and we developed House Bill 3093, which forced the sheriffs to use all resources, which includes search dogs, helicopters, FLIR systems, man trackers, and uh, it made them more accountable. They didn't like that. They didn't like anybody telling them how to do their job. So that's when I got blackballed out of the, the call list there 
because I was no longer one of the good old boys that would keep his mouth shut. Yeah. You know, and uh, the DA refused to file criminal charges against the sheriff, which I disagree with, but that's, you know, they have to live with themselves. So anyway, that's uh, how it all started. They don't, a lot of people don't like to hear the truth. Yeah. And it's very, it's disturbing. I mean, it hurts cases and it um, just, I don't know. I I will never get it. Well, um, they, they tried to shut me down. They, they came in and did this huge investigation with the Department of Justice and audited my records. I've seen that. And people yeah. tried to drag you down to the... Yeah, everything, every time they tried to do that, it just it <laughs> drove me up because I had an IRS agent <laughs> set up my books, meaning that he helped me develop my books and record keeping. Plus, uh -huh. I'm a former police officer, so I know how to document the files. And so when the DOJ came in and said, we, we're going to audit you, I said, fine. I handed them a CD with all my records and said, here you go. And they complimented me after their three-year audit. They said, these are the best record keeping they'd ever seen. And, it, <laughs> and everything that I said I did, I did. And I they, love it when the good man wins once in a while. Yeah, it, but that totally backfired on them. Uh, I, so that, and that's when the DOJ turned me into a professional contractor. They said, why don't you turn into a private professional contractor and work under contract? That way the shares have no say in what you do. As long as you obey the laws, which I do, of course, then there's nothing they can do about it. Wow. Um, hold on. You don't have to do it now, but, um, you know, I know, well, whenever we're done, I'm going to open the book. I just sent you an email. Um, because I want to show people some things out of the book that I did read that I wanted to let people, you know, hear. Um, so I just sent you an email, but that's my email. If you could send me the book. Um, uh, <clears throat> Widow said, and it's not that people tell police how to do their job. We just have different tools. I have more respect more respect for any law enforcement officer who uses all resources. You know, if you go in there and respond to the house and you sit there and meet with the family and take a missing child report, nine out of 10 times that child is hiding in the house or it's in the neighbor's house or it's at his best friend's house. And it can be resolved real quickly by bringing out a search dog and find out many times I found the child hiding in the laundry room or underneath the house or in a, fort oh nearby God. and the search is over with it's a happy ending and then everybody goes home but also there's been a few times where i've caught the parents and in lies including a deputy sheriff from douglas county tommy gibson's case larry gibson we were able to prove that larry killed his son oh God. you know he, the state police called me in on that one and we were able to prove that he uh tommy had died in the kitchen and that you know, his his dad, who was a deputy at the time, uh, moved his body from the back of the patrol car to a different area. And and what, with, but with the search dogs, we were able to prove all that. So when he made this false report that his son was missing, we were able to prove that you know he was lying. In what county was that? Douglas County, Roseburg, Oregon. Oh my goodness, that is insane. What case to you has been, I know they're all close to you, but like which one has been the most, you know, personal? Um, There's so many. Um, yeah. the, I think the best one for me was the Turkey earthquake in 1999. My dog alerted in Adivasari at a 18 story structure that had collapsed. And my dog refused to leave this one spot. And we tunneled for eight hours and found a little girl alive after 10 days. No food, no water, no light, laying next to her dead mom. Oh, God. We're eating, uh, the rats were eating on the mom's body. And oh. we had to, the Doctors Without Borders came in and amputated that little girl's legs to get her out of there. But she lived. So that, I'd say that was a, probably one of the better ones. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That, that's amazing. I can't imagine. Uh, like, that made me emotional wow oh, yeah 
yeah, I went and visited her in the hospital uh, before we flew oh. home. Yeah, uh, yeah, it was just amazing. Do you keep contact with like the you know some of the families or? Um, once once in a while, kind of a funny story. I was going down to Cabo San Pedro on a, a case for the Canadian government for a, a Canadian citizen missing from a resort down there. And the people sitting in front of me on the airplane, my dog flies, I'm in uniform. The dog flies at my feet inside the aircraft because it's a search and rescue dog. Mm -hmm. And the people in front of me, I had found their son who was a runaway the year before. The people behind me, I found their cat a month before. And the people sitting in the aisle in front of them, I had found their dog missing about three years earlier. So it was small talk about a small world. Wow. <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> it's kind of comical. I just, thank you for all you do for humans in general. I mean, you. you know, um, it's amazing to see. And thank you for taking the time to share with us because we definitely appreciate it. Well, there's a lot of good men and women out there that try to help, you know, a lot of volunteers uh, that help, uh, like the Arctic Fox, true crime stuff, and there, and other people, uh, and what you do, you know, by putting the information out there. Uh, yeah. Families need to learn that they have to look out for themselves because somebody else will, you know, and they have to be able to call in the right resources. And, you know, I'm pretty much retired right now, and plus I just had a knee surgery, so I'm definitely out of picture right now until my knee heals but i've trained thousands of other handlers around the world and they're up and ready to go so i get about three to four calls every single day of missing person cases throughout the united states and a lot of times i can consult like no 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 i can look, <laughs> I can look at a map and kind of tell them where to go look and generally that's where they find them just yeah I know in a couple of cases I've seen you post on Facebook like this is what you know you can do and you you give them um, you know ideas and I've asked you about some cases and you're like well just have the family email me so I can explain you know some yeah. things to do and because I know it's hard you can't go everywhere in the world no. especially you know you're retired about and yeah. um, but it's awesome that you is there since we're talking about this is there like a place a website a facebook page where you could go and find responsible handlers like yourself yeah what you do is you contact me and i will get you attached to who what you need who you need okay. all right that's a lot on you but i, I definitely it is am very thankful to have that information yeah if somebody's interested in doing what you do, like how, what can you give advice, how to start? Um, well, the first thing I, I recommend is if you want to wander around with a 50 pound pack and on 60 degree slopes and bear poop and poison oak, you need a mm -hmm. lobotomy, get a lobotomy. Um, in all honesty, uh, <laughs> now, you know, you can contact the local sheriff's office and you can, they have some fantastic teams that you can join. Uh, they're trying to improve themselves. Uh, um, the if you want to go private, more and more teams are going private now. They're fed up with all the politics, and you can contact me, and I'll send you my books, and you can train yourself. Yeah, uh, I just started a team two days ago in Johannesburg, South Africa. Oh wow! Um, I have teams in Turkey, in the Philippines, uh, um, Honduras. Oh my gosh. So you have people everywhere. I'm up in Alaska. Uh, uh, I helped train the, the Sitka Alaska teams. Um, so that is awesome. So I also trained the St. Croix. St. Croix was fun. There was a lot of, uh, we had to test the, the, the rum. <laughs> oh, I bet that was. <laughs> I'm not a drinker, but it, so it doesn't take much to get me drunk. And they, oh my God. Showed me the rum stills and it was pretty good. <laughs> we get we were getting called there all the time because of all the homicides related drug related homicides. So I finally ended up training their own fire department with their dogs so that I didn't have to keep flying every weekend to St. Thomas, St. Croix, and all that. 
Wow. See, it just amazes me. Um, you know, everything that you do. Um, you guys, that is Harry's email once again on the screen. Um, if you have any questions or if you know a missing person in a different state, maybe Harry can give you the resources. Um, yeah, I was just able to help a family in, in uh, Barstow, California. Her son was missing and be able to guide her to where her son's remains were. So. Oh, my God. Hey, I just got a question because um, I, I know none of this has to do with money and we can't put a value on you know, human life. We just can't. Right. But I, I see you're not charging for your books. You're not. Is there a place where we can donate? Is there a place that yeah. we can help you raise funds? Well, sure. I mean, I'm a business, so I can't you can't write it off. Um, but um, yeah, if you write me, I, I'll send you our Venmo account. And you can. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. It. Like, absolutely. We can, I, I just, we can accept gifts. I mean, we're trying to. I'm trying to raise money now to get a boat so I can do water searches uh, and not have to rely on other people. Oh, that's right. Awesome. Well, if you send me that information so I can um, post it as well. Yeah. Yeah. We would love to be able to help you raise some funds, you know, um, to, to get these necessities. Like I said, uh, it's, it's amazing to me that you, you put these books out and they're free um, to help others, you know, like you said, the one book uh, that's there, there might be some young kid that doesn't have a problem carrying around a 60 pound bag and trampling through poison oak at 50. I'm not doing that, no. but, um, <laughs> you know, your, your willingness to share with others is amazing. Well, I, I've been given a gift and that's the ability to help others. So, you know, why not use that? Hold on, you guys. Somebody's knocking at my door. I will be right back. Arctic, do you have any questions? Are you still with us? I'm yeah, sorry. I'm here. I'm here. I, I think it's amazing everything that Harry's been able to do with his dogs and training all these other teams and everything. And there's a couple of cases that, that I certainly may reach out to him on where these families just aren't having any luck anywhere else. So... It, it's good to have that information to reach out to him in some of these cases. And, you know, I, I like that through my channel, I've been able to meet people like Harry, like Loudwater Outfitters, who I sent out to go search for a man today whose boat overturned in, in uh, uh, North Myrtle Beach, South Carolina last night at 4.56 p.m. So they're out there searching for him right now. Yeah, and that's what's frustrating on my end. I can sit here and watch the Coast Guard and everybody else go out and look for these drowning victims. Why aren't they bringing their own dogs out there? A dog can identify somebody. I found a body a mile offshore of the Grand Cayman Islands in 800 feet of water. The body gas is when a person drowns, the body gas is flowed to the surface. It's a very simple process of searching. And when the dog alerted, we put a, a water marker in there. Uh, they brought in an underwater video camera and was able to pinpoint where the remains were he got eaten by a shark but the bottom line is uh there's no excuse for not finding a drowning victim it's it's a very simple process if you do it properly um uh, some and somebody just asked uh, i think it was widow uh what do you do if the police in the area are so corrupt and won't let people go in and do the search and everything swept under the rug. We run into cases like that every day. Uh, every single day we have law enforcement who cover stuff up. And as you can see now the uh, with the uh, Black Lives Movement as well as uh, just the exposure to law enforcement. Uh, when I went to the academy in 1974, we had 150 people that went to the academy, 45 of us graduated. And at that time, I never had heard of any corruption. And, and through my career in law enforcement, I run into three different officers that were uh, corrupt. And we turned everything over to internal affairs and let them handle it, and it was taken care of. So uh, when you run into something like that, 
the best thing you can tell the family to do is document everything. Uh, sometimes we'll, we'll, we'll force the issue. We'll have, we'll go to the department of justice and say, you know, we want you to take over this case, or we want a different agency to take over this case. And there's times they will, and there's times they won't. A lot of times if the county screwed up a case really bad, we'll ask the state police to come in and they may or may not. A lot of times they don't want to step on anybody's toes, but if it's really bad, they will. And, uh, that's exactly what happened on the Nathan Madsen case. The state police came in and assisted us in the recovery of uh, Nathan's remains. So, so like pri private citizens can come in and, and um, with backing from the community and whatnot, uh, sort of request for other agencies to start looking. They can. It, again, you've got to make sure that these people know what they're doing. Unfortunately, right, right. we've got some bad dog teams out there who have, uh, they've set up, we had a young lady back east that I read about who was planting evidence, planting human teeth and, yeah. and claiming yeah. that she found this and found this and that. That is disgusting. You know, and it just destroys everything that uh, all the other good handlers like myself and everybody else are trying to do. And right. So, uh, you know, once I was accused, by Clark County Sheriff's Office of planning evidence at a scene. And I actually went and took a polygraph and proved. Oh my it. God. What had happened is a sand item belonging to a person we were looking for ended up in some clothing that we found in a field over in the center. And I, I know who had that sand item. And I, it turned out that his uncle was the one who owned that property and we were able to prove and he had ended up get, getting arrested. He was a deputy with Clark County Sheriff's Office and was get, that made the accusation and he ended up getting arrested for it. But I had to clear my name by taking a polygraph and, and all that, which is fine. I have no problem, you know, clearing my name because uh, I'm proud of what I've done and everything I've ever, that's another thing that you had mentioned that a lot of people poo poo my work. Well, they can, but the bottom line is anytime somebody bad mouths me, um, I ask them to come forward with any kind of factual document yes. evidence to support their claims. And nobody's been able to do that in 51 years. I don't know if you remember the mayor or the ex mayor in that disappeared and they found his body in, in the Yamhill River uh, just recently. Uh, the uh, uh, Adventures with Purpose team went in there and found his remains uh, over there in, in uh, Sheridan or Tualatin, somewhere out in that area. Uh -uh. But anyway, he had disappeared a year ago and they lost a big search, couldn't find anything. Um, the family reached out to me and said, we want you in on this. So I sent him my contract. But then his granddaughter started bad-mouthing me, saying, well, you're a fake, you're a fraud, we want nothing to do with you, you're a scam artist. And I was totally appalled about what her comments. I said, you know, I don't know where you get your information, but everything I've said I've done is documented. It's been proven in a court of law. I'm 100% credible. And anyway, they went and looked and looked and looked, couldn't find anything. And on my day off, my son lived out in that area, so I went and visited my son. I stopped in and checked a few areas and a deputy from Yamhill County was right there watching me when I uh, told him where the uh, a body was. And Adventures with Purpose had already been out there and hadn't found anything. But uh, when I made it insisted that there was a body out there, they went back in there and sure enough, that's where he was. Now, do you think that young lady would apologize to me for her ludicrous com comments? No, but that's the kind of crap we face you know, because we're private and we have to deal with it. That's so sad. So. Sometimes it's hard to to see so much negative and remember that there's just as much light. We just usually aren't, aren't as loud. Yeah. As it's like the, the Kyron Horman case. It's very frustrating. You know, we... It is super. Um, here you have a, uh, a young child who deserves to be found. And... Uh, there's just so many things about this case where it's been mishandled that he may never be found. So and I was going to ask, because that was where my question came the other day. We were speaking about Kyron Horman and somebody said, well, 
are you sure that the um, police didn't ask Harry to back off? And I said, well, you know, I'm pretty sure the family could have told him, you know, that they wanted him to search uh, um, as well. Karen, Karen's dad refuses to let me search on his property. And every time we get near the property, three of our search dogs give death alerts. Now, that could, doesn't mean it's Kyron. It could be somebody completely different. There's a bunch of woods back there. It could be a homeless person. Uh -huh. It could be Kyron's remains. It is also rumored that when Terry tried to hire the Hispanic gentleman to kill Kane, uh -huh. um, the Hispanic gentleman's family disappeared the next day. Yeah. So we don't know if it's their remains or back in there. But I find it very odd that Kane, A, says, we only want state certified search dogs. Well, I'm the founder of the search dog program for the state of Oregon. I don't yeah. know why more. <laughs> right. Uh, and also, he set up a no trespassing signs, cameras, and got a dog right after that. Oh, something he's trying to. That's very. That's, yeah. And there was a reported sighting of Kyron with a man that looked like Kane at a grocery store right after he went missing. So. Yeah, there's all sorts. There's all sorts of issues on this case that, you know, I have somebody from Las Vegas who says that. Um, Kane, that he was the neighbor. That Kane has a family down there. Yeah. Kyron was seen down there with them a week later. So, uh, and we turned all that information over to the FBI. So, I mean, I do you believe that just all the misinformation is messing up Kyron's case. Like, what do you believe that could have been different, done differently, or do, done now? Well, I would have started from the beginning and just did a search of Kane's <laughs> property, uh -huh. um, as well as the school. Uh, yeah. Just be just to rule out the no foul play. Um, well, that's, they, that's, they, interesting they that oh, said, that's interesting that you say that because somebody the other day said, "Well, could his body be stuck in the school?" But I, I'm not sure if there were dogs. I would think they would have had dogs look, but wouldn't the smell? Well, again, they're using the same dogs they couldn't find Ashley Miranda. Right. You you got to remember now. He just said. You know, he his dog alerted the minute he got in the hallway. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, um, and they had been there seven times. That's amazing to me. Like, I, so, uh, I don't put any credibility in the state of Oregon search dogs. I, there's, I, we've done so much research and we see like corruption and, you know, um, <clears throat> egos, lots of egos. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, one thing we did find uh, was a cult worshiping pentagram on the Horman property. Yeah, so I I don't know if they were into the occult, and that, that could be a motive for well, my kind well, of fear. You remember the um, uh, the neighbors I brought up? They were, um, you know, one was a younger a younger child like Kyron, but he had older brothers. They were into uh, worship, like the devil, and they were all into that weird stuff, and they were neighbors to him. Um, so I find that very interesting that you did find that. Um, and they didn't do anything with what you found? I mean... Well, you know, we, we, we've we notified Multnomah County Sheriff's Office that we were getting death alerts off King's property. And it's their case. They can do what they follow up on it, how they want it. And... One of the volunteers took a picture of where our dogs were alerting, and we have an outline of a child's spirit peeking through the trees there. You know, this is all done by a volunteer. It had nothing to do with us, except that the dogs were alerting in that spot. Uh, yeah. I thought that was very interesting. I see, um, I've seen the picture, and I also remember when we did Kyron's um, video. I forgot if you said that you spoke to Terry. Like, was she like, did she say, yeah, go ahead and search? Or was it just up to Kane because it was his? Uh, I've never talked to Terry. Uh, uh, the only, Terry did send me an email um, during the search and said, good luck. That's all she said. Um, but uh, Kate, again, we've offered to Kane and he's refused. And, to me as a parent, 
I wouldn't care who found my child. Yeah. Um, so why why is he not why was he hiding there on his property? Yeah, and the tip like Arctic said that, you know, I we've had multiple tips of people that seen somebody with cane or that looks like cane um at a store with Kyron. One of them was at a Fred Myers uh a couple of days later. Um we posted them on the group. But you know, I'm hoping Ellie looks at these things seriously. We know that Kane does have family all over. Um, you know, I'm not saying anything, but it's definitely I hope people are looking into it. Um I'll send it to you, Widow. Uh Harry, do you mind me showing Widow the picture that you sent? No, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. okay. Hold on, you guys, I'll be right. Yeah. Yeah, it's just it's frustrating that you know, this one child that needs to be brought home, dead or alive. Yes, however he's brought home, as long as he's home. Yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, you know, bringing him home would at least start to give some answers. Well, one of the problems we face is that his birth mom, Desiree is married to a detective in Klamath County. And that's the county that I testified against. Right, right. So, so they sort sorry. of formed a bond that you were not going to be involved. Exactly. Do you think that um, also just having that tunnel vision from the beginning, it messed the case up? I mean... It's not going to mess the case up. It's, I mean... There's a, there's a particular way um, of doing a, a, a methodical search for a missing person, whether it be Kyron or anybody else. You always start at home. You start with the house. You start with the school. You start with the friends. And you work out from there. And, and every person that is in his life yeah. should have been investigated yeah. To the fullest. I mean, you yeah. don't have to physically be there no. that day to be responsible. Well, there's been so many rumors, you know. Um, somebody said they saw Terry's Mustang down there at Sylvie's Island after that. Well, D.D. Spicer sitting in Terry's car with Terry's phone. What a what a better way of throwing the police off because they're, they are they know that they're going to ping Terry's phone. Yeah. So they ping her phone on Salvi's Island, and somebody says, "Oh, I saw a redhead driving it." Everybody's going to assume it's Terry. How how do we know it's not Dee Dee? You know, and Dee Dee right. refused to cooperate in the initial investigation. So there's a lot of questions there. There's so many, and I wish. <clears throat> I mean, I believe the LE now is. I'm hoping they're going all the way back, like they told James. They're looking overseas. I believe that they're going back and looking at every single, you know, person and tip seriously. Um, it's just so weird. It's 12 years and there's no evidence he's gone. There's just no evidence. And, and that was not the, the focus of today's conversation. We wanted to yeah. talk to you about the Weaver case, um, yeah. you know, and learn more about what you do. And like yeah. I said, um, we definitely support, you know, uh, your kindness. We cannot thank you for enough. Thank you. Exactly. Yeah. I love having you on. I love, you know, all the posts, your old, you know, the articles that you post and just the cases that you've helped. And it's definitely awesome. Um, hold on one second. What? My son, he just, he got uh, tested positive for the flu and like the neighbors are knocking at the door. Can you guys come outside? I'm like, no, <laughs> <That's> flu, no. <coughs> uh, Widow, yeah, I'm going to send you that because Widow is a psychic medium and she could pick up a lot from a picture. I think that's awesome. Um, you know, she doesn't know a lot about the case, like. She's never heard of it, and we met each other off of YouTube. So that would be interesting for her to see and what she picks up. 
one of the problems that we faced with any public disappearance is uh, all these alleged psychics. I do believe that there are psychics out there who really do know what they're doing, but then you get all those thousands that don't. And I was getting two or three calls a day. One lady called me at three o'clock in the morning to come over to a specific area, not too far from where Kane lived and kept pointing at this hole and screaming, he's here, he's here, he's here. And it was a gopher hole. And my dogs are looking at me like, what are we doing here? Oh. And, you know, and so now when somebody claims they're a psychic, I ask them to produce documentation where, where they have proven that, you know, to the, to the police and to a family member, they've been able to solve X amount of cases. And because uh, if they have that, then I'll be more than happy to listen to them. And what, I'll take anybody's input. If anybody says, well, this is what I believe. You know, if my dogs validate it, great. If they don't, then so be it. I mean, none of us are perfect. I've been wrong before, too. And uh, so I just, I, I take everything with a grain of salt. I listen to what they have people have to say. And if, again, if my dog supports it, then great. And if it doesn't, so be it. Yeah. Well, I definitely, I believe, you know, I believe in um, psychics and mediums, and I've spoken to a few, and um, Widow said, and it's those fakes I give myself a terrible name. She said, oh, I have proof of what I do. I'm just starting with cases. She's done summer cases. Like, you can watch videos she's done. It's it's so amazing what I've seen so far of uh, what Widow has done. Um, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I'm probably one of the biggest critics of psychics that, that exist. But I would be curious to see what Widow comes up with having gone into this case unindoctrinated and not having heard everything. So. Yeah. Sure. You can't hurt anything. Mm -mm. That's what I've heard. That's, what I, that's why I was excited when she came in, you know, and she reached out to me and she... I'm trying, I'm like going over the case, but then I'm like, wait, you know, she keeps reminding me, no, don't tell me anything. Don't tell me anything. So we are supposed to, I'm going to send her that picture first, but um, I am interested and very interested. Um, you know, I've been on the phone and I've heard, you know, just stuff that I can't hear that she can hear. It's amazing. Um, she came to Summer's case blind as well. If you guys check out her channel, you can see some of the stuff that, you know, she's done. Um, well, listen, I'm going to have to let you go because, like I said, I just had knee surgery five days ago. And I'm up yes. to pain meds here and I've got to get take some more here. Well, I hope that you heal fast. I hope Thank you. you know, um, so I want to do this piece. Um, it's my, my second knee surgery. I've been through this before, so I know what I'm in for. It. It's no fun. I, oh, I didn't believe it. And you have what, like six weeks? You have to go through therapy and. Oh yeah, yeah, in the next six weeks, it's uh, physical therapy. Uh, but it is what it is. Well, I will be praying for you, and we really appreciate you coming on here. And sure. um, yeah, just reach out to me. I'll be glad to share anything with you. Yeah, um, if you have time when you get off, could you? Check the mail so you can send me the book again, please. I want to. Okay. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate it, everybody. This is Harry Oaks. Um, his information I'm going to put in the description box when we get off of here. Um, thank you so much, Harry, for coming on here. Thank you to everybody else for all you what you guys do, too. I appreciate it. Arctic, Garnet, you guys have anything? Yes. No, nope, we just are want to thank him for what he does, and you know, like I said, I probably will be reaching out with some of the cases that I need help with here I'm shortly. So, glad to try to help any way I can. All right, well, thank you. Oh, <laughs> all right, guys, let's get off here. Well, I'm gonna go through um, something just because you know, I just wanted to read this article okay. about the actual story of the case because. Okay. We didn't get through um, the brother. I mean, go ahead. The son, the grandfather, all of them. Um, 
Hold on one second. Mm, let me find it. I had it, but then I started pulling up all of uh, Harry's stuff. Sorry if you guys hear my crazy kids in the background. <laughs> All right, so <coughs> I just want to, you guys just, okay. In August 2002, Francis Weaver, the son of Ward no, Weaver the third contacted Oregon City Police to report his father had raped his 19-year-old girlfriend, Wrong Francis Weaver's girlfriend. Hold on, you guys. Let me... Hold on. Widow, she was going to go over the case that we started with, which was the Ward Weaver um, and the two girls. That's the case she's going to read about. Yeah, I just want to, you know, explain to some people that haven't heard it, just the whole um, story. Uh, all right, I just had it and now I lost it again. Okay, so... His son called um, Oregon City Police to report his father had raped his 19-year-old girlfriend. Francis Weaver's girlfriend had escaped his father's house practically naked, flagged down a passing motorist, and had been taken to a nearby place of safety. But there was one more thing Francis Weaver wanted to report. His father had also just confessed to killing two missing girls. The 2002 disappearance of Ashley Pond and Miranda Gaddis in Oregon City shone the national spotlight firmly on Ward Weaver III. He lived just up the street from the missing girls, and in a July 2002 TV news interview, Weaver would stand right on the concrete slab where he had buried one of them. And the lead up to Weaver's arrest for the murders of Pond and Gaddis, Gaddis would reveal a chilling family history of violence. Born on April 6, 1963 in Northern California, Ward Weaver III was raised in an earlier generation of Weaver family violence. His father, Ward Weaver Jr., practically abandoned him at age four, and Weaver's mother remained a heavy drinker who often beat Weaver with his belt. Weaver would, in turn, take his frustrations out on his younger siblings frequently beating his younger stepbrother <coughs> and inflicting cruelty on his younger sister, who couldn't recall a time when her brother wasn't <clears throat> hurting her. In April 1981, a relative accused Weaver of rape, but he had just enlisted in the Navy, so police did not pursue charges. By May 1982, Weaver was, other than honorably discharged, and brought his Philippine girlfriend home marrying her in August 1984. The couple would have four children, and Weaver's pattern of control and violence would continue throughout their relationship. The couple moved to Bakerfield, California, with Weaver hoping to reconnect with his father, who was on trial for murder. Um, so in 1981, Weaver Jr., a truck driver, stopped for a broken down couple's car, beat the 18 year old to death with a lead pipe and kidnapped his 23 year old girlfriend. Um, Ward Weaver III and the disappearance of Ashley Pond and Miranda Gaddis. So in August, 1997, Ward Weaver III, twice divorced, rented a house at 2507 South Beaver Creek Road in Oregon City. Weaver's 12 year old daughter, Mallory, hung out with two school friends. 12-year-old Ashley Pond and 13-year-old Miranda Gaddis. The three school friends were members of the same school, dance class, and Weaver's daughter had regular sleepovers with Pond and other friends at the Weaver house. That is so sad that these people were friends with his daughter. And his right. Daughter, I, oh, 
the neighborhood um it reminds me of those that case um with the bus driver that took those three girls and they they were gone for a long long time uh uh jc dugard no um oh shoot he killed himself before he even oh you know i'm not sure honey okay well, they were locked in a basement, chained up in rooms. Like he got this one girl pregnant like three or four times. It was right. Amazing. I forgot. Uh, okay, so the neighborhood girls walked past Weaver's house toward their school bus stop. And sometimes Weaver even gave Pond a lift to school when she was running late or missed the bus. In late 2001, Pond accused Weaver of attempting to rape her in his house. And while the incident was reported to police, no charges were filed. That summer, Pond had lived in the Weaver home to escape her own chaotic home life. Tragically, Pond and Goddess had both endured sexual assault in their homes. Pond from her father, Goddess from her mother's boyfriend. On January 9, 2002, Pond disappeared into thin air while walking to the bus stop. Media crews swarmed the street as weeks passed without her return, and the FBI entered the case. Meanwhile, investigators learned the criminal history of the man living at the top of the street, including violence against his two ex-wives. On January 23rd, a media crew interviewed girls waiting at the bus stop. You guys, and one of those girls was Miranda. So she was on the news, you know, pleading for her best friend to come home, and she missed her. So then on March 8th, Gaddis herself vanished. Um, intense media scrutiny fell on Ward Weaver III as his suspicious presence played out on news TV broadcasts. Police searched his house to no avail. News cameras showed FBI sniffer dogs around his property and the presence of a jacuzzi. Hold on, you guys. Oh, Arctic left us. Oh, there he is. I'm like, where'd he go? Um, all right. So as his suspicious presence played out on news TV broadcast, police searched his house to no avail. News cameras showed FBI sniffer dogs around his property and the presence of a jacuzzi ready for installation. We were downplayed at all. Then on July 3rd, 2002, agreed to a uh, news interview inside his house. Bizarrely admitting to the FBI's number one suspect, Weaver gave the reporter a tour of his house, discussing the girls' sleepovers with a People magazine on the girls' disappearance in view. Then Weaver led the reporter outside, walking over a new concrete slab, recently forged in the rear yard. Weaver said he was installing a jacuzzi. The last time I checked, that wasn't against the law, he said. Um, so in August, suspicions of Weaver intensified when he told a news crew he planned to move away from Oregon, and cameras captured him entering his house with his son's girlfriend. On August 13th, Weaver was arrested for raping the young woman. And Francis Weaver told police his father had confessed to the missing girl's murder. Um, with Weaver in jail, his landlord placed eviction notices at the house and in the backyard shed, noticed many flyers near a pile of cardboard boxes. Um, so the FBI obtained a search warrant on August 23rd, sealing off the property. Tents cover the area of the shed and the concrete slab. Um, the family's worst fears were confirmed as the FBI discovered, see, and I, this is, discovered the body of Ashley in a cardboard box in Weaver's shed, and Miranda Gaddis's body was discovered in an oil barrel beneath the concrete slab. Just as Weaver's father had goofed another son in 1981, Francis Weaver helped dig the hole for his dad, thinking it was for the jacuzzi. Um, so on October 2nd, 2002, Ward Weaver was um, indicted and charged with six counts of aggravated murder and various counts of rape and sexual abuse. Um, in September 2004, to avoid the death penalty, Weaver pled 
uh, a plea bargain, admitting to two charges and no contest to the rest. He was still sentenced to two life sentences without parole. So, and then his, I'm not going to get into all this, but his uh, son also ended up in prison for murder and robbing a drug dealer. So it was like a whole family affair. It's funny that that article doesn't mention that Harry Oaks searched at all. You know, um, it just goes. To well, it does talk about the concrete slab, which Harry talked yeah. about his dogs hit here. You guys, there are articles that say uh, that talk about Harry, and then oh, I, I get it. I'm just saying that. Yeah, I know. that's sort of an example of how you know we just admit what we don't want anybody to know. Exactly. Exactly. The media doesn't always speak the whole truth or any of the truth. Um, you guys have just heard it that Kane didn't want. We search. are going to get wrapped up in that. She doesn't want to know details. Oh, yeah. I keep forgetting. But, yeah, you guys. Um, so, we just heard from... He's became a good friend to us. He's an amazing guy. Harry Oaks. Uh, his email, I will put down there in the description. Please email him if you ever have questions about, you know, a missing person or... Um, He's Super, super easy to talk to down yes. to earth and if he can't directly help you he's going to put you in places where you can get help oh yeah. yeah he definitely will I know that if my kids I need to start doing what he said and if my kids I'm not knock on wood oh, that's going to be a whole weekend thing for me <laughs> We're all the grandbabies down and uh, you know take pictures collect hair samples, maybe we'll do, I don't know. I'm yeah. going to figure out something. Because, if, yeah, I'm definitely doing that, and I know the first person I am calling is Harry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll go to a different song on you. On oh, no, wait. We're not going to, we're not talking about it anymore. We're actually about to wrap it up. Um, I know Arctic has a Casey has to get out there. Um, I don't know. Yeah, you did it already, right, Arctic? Yeah, I mean, I've always got cases in my stack that I need to do, but I got the important, the the ones that were high priority that I really wanted to get out. They're out right now. Okay. Well, I shared the ones that you put up. Um, I am interested. I put the one that I told you about uh, for tomorrow. Um, we have a lot of other stuff myself and Garnett are working on. Um, when I see that checking is, is going to possibly be back with us next week. Where does which go? is awesome, which means we should probably postpone the, uh, the little boy, the little na the, the little boy from Hawaii until checking is back and we can do a huge think tank on it. That would be awesome. Well, that will give me time to go over more of the culture thing I was talking about. So, yeah, I'll, I'll post home. Arctic, I would really like to, at some point, find some time to go over Darley. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, I think that's a case that I really want to just, you know, um, I, I do think that it was sad, so... Oh, the silly thing. Yeah. Well, all right. Like you said, I'm I'm supposed to be doing homework right now, and I'm not getting any of that done because my dog's looking at me. I am not getting anything done either. So I need to. Um, I put the one video that we were Arctic commented on, but this is it's important. To show stuff like that. So not only me, guys. Okay, I work. We, we have a reason for it. We're doing. We have something coming up. Um, I would. I would love to help y'all in any way I can as well. 
Yes, well, that would be amazing. You know, I, I haven't had an opportunity to formally meet you, but um, I'm definitely very, very interested in all of this. Yes. Um, even on a personal level, I'd like to at some point reach out to you. Definitely. All right. Does anyone else have anything to say? No, I'm good. All right. Well, if you guys have not subscribed to Arthur Fox True Crime, please go check his channel up, out. Subscribe on um, Second Conviction as well. Uh, myself and Burnett, if you haven't subscribed to our channel, please subscribe. Hit the like on the video. And we will see you next time. Everybody have a great day, a safe weekend. And thank you for watching. Bye. Bye. Wait, and it just doesn't have to be with my gifts, but any cases. Widow, yes. Like, we, you know, if you want to start coming on panel, we love having people on panel. Somebody the other day said, why don't you um, start, you know, um, recording videos? Well, I like interacting with people. I like, you know, answering questions in the comments. I like hearing other people's thoughts, theories, and if I do record it, I know that I will just walk away from the computer and not, you know, it's different. So I like doing lives and we love people coming on panel. You are too, Widow. I love you. <coughs> and I am going to get back to you. It's just been a crazy, hectic day. Um, my son, as you know, has a few. Oh, but I'm going to call you. <clears throat> Let me put my tablet to charge. I am on the computer, and I will call you in like 30 minutes. But thank you, everybody, for watching. Please, please, please go check out our uh, videos. Give them a like. Share them. It will really help um, bring awareness to these things. And we will see you later. Mm -hmm.